My generation was fortunate enough to grow up with some of the best TV programs ever made, including some outstanding films that were specifically made for television. Among these were a score of science fiction and horror films, some of which were quite well made. In this video, I'll take you back to those days, back to the 1970s and 80s, as we revisit what I feel are the 10 best made-for-TV horror films ever. Starting off with number 10, working backward here, we have Night Gallery. The pilot episode of Rod Serling's 1969 follow-up to his iconic Twilight Zone series features three tales of the macabre, each told in Serling's signature style, where the supernatural serves as a vehicle for conveying deeper themes. The first episode, and my personal favorite in this anthology, is The Cemetery, starring Roddy McDowell and Ossie Davis. McDowell portrays Jeremy Evans, a parasitic and thoroughly base young man who murders his rich uncle in order to inherit his wealth and property. In the days following his uncle's death and internment, Evans notices that a painting depicting the family home and graveyard has undergone a subtle change. His uncle's grave is now open in the portrait. Each night afterward, the painting continues to change, with his uncle's coffin appearing in the open grave, and then his uncle's corpse leaving the grave and approaching the house. The tension builds steadily as Evans becomes increasingly unhinged, certain that his evil deed has returned to visit him. Yet, there is still one more twist to come. The second episode, Eyes, stars Joan Crawford as Claudia Menlo, a wealthy woman who has gone blind and determines to recover her sight at any cost. She offers $9,000 to a desperate man to donate his eyes to her, knowing that even if the transplant surgery is successful, she will only be able to see for about 11 hours. This episode of the Night Gallery pilot is especially notable for the fact that it marks one of actress Joan Crawford's last screen roles and was also the directorial debut of a 22-year-old by the name of Steven Spielberg. The last episode in this anthology, The Escape Route, stars Richard Keeley as Joseph Strobe, a Nazi war criminal who, in a very literal sense, finds that there is considerable truth in the old saying, a man often meets his destiny on the road he takes to avoid it. Number 9. Don't Be Afraid of the Dark, 1973. Kim Darby plays Sally Farnham, a young woman who has just inherited a mansion from her grandmother and moves in with the hope of refurbishing, redecorating, and generally making it her own. It's really a terrific house, Sally tells her husband, Alex, played by Jim Hutton. But what Sally doesn't know is that behind its ornate and charming old world facade, this terrific house conceals a menace, a trio of tiny demonic creatures determined to make Sally one of their own. All they need is for her to free them from their decades-long confinement, which, of course, she inevitably does in time-honored horror movie fashion, by ignoring a warning to leave well enough alone. Some things are better left as they are, the old caretaker, Mr. Harris, tells her when Sally asks him to open an old fireplace that her grandmother had sealed 20 years before. And as the story unfolds, Sally quickly comes to wish that she had listened to him. Aspects of this film are dated and the creature effects may seem cheesy by today's standards, but director John Newland succeeds in building atmosphere and giving us some genuinely tense and creepy moments as the creatures stalk Sally and wreak havoc in the house. This movie is also famous for having one of the more memorable TV horror movie finales. As a kid, I seriously wanted to drop a case of dynamite down that fireplace. Number 8. Don't Go to Sleep, 1982 Directed by Richard Lang and starring veteran TV actors Valerie Harper, Dennis Weaver, and Ruth Gordon, Don't Go to Sleep tells the story of the gradual destruction of a suburbanite family at the hands of what may either be a twisted human psyche or a supernatural force bent on vengeance. The film leaves its audience guessing on this point until the very last moment, which is truly another of the greatest television horror movie finales. Following the death of their oldest child, Jennifer, parents Philip and Laura move into a new home with son Kevin, daughter Mary, and grandma Bernice, intent on beginning a new chapter in their lives. It isn't long, however, before strange events commence. Mary is plagued by nightmares, begins hearing noises in her room, and one night her bed catches fire for no apparent reason. Eventually, she's confronted with the ghost of her sister, Jennifer, who gradually turns Mary against everyone in her family. Tragedy soon follows, and once again the viewer is left wondering exactly who or what is responsible. Don't Go to Sleep was perhaps the last of the great made-for-TV horror movies. The cast is excellent, the score haunting, the tension palpable at times, and the child actors as well as the adults turn in memorable performances. In my opinion, the standout performance in this film is Valerie Harper as Laura. Although Harper is mostly remembered for her comedic work in sitcoms such as The Mary Tyler Moore Show and Rhoda, here she demonstrates that she had considerable dramatic acting chops as well. You can't take it. Neither can I. All of this is not just happening to you, Philip. Oh, come on. I don't know what he was doing on the roof. He was in the kitchen not two minutes before. Take it.
making a cookie. Oh, my mother and two of my children have died this year and honey, one year. Honey, and what do we get from you, this honey, weeping, you... drunk bitch? It is indulgent, Philip. And don't lean on me. I can't comfort you now. I can't do everything I can. If you love made-for-TV movies, this is definitely one that you should not miss. The film made a considerable impression on my generation, and many who couldn't remember its name eventually found it again by googling the phrase, horror movie pizza cutter scene. If you know, you know. Number 7. This is the Dead of Night. Dead of Night, 1977. Directed by veteran horror film producer Dan Curtis, Dead of Night features three tales of the macabre. One of mystery, one of imagination, and one of terror. Each penned by the late great Richard Matheson. The first story, Second Chance, is a mostly forgettable time travel tale about a boy in his car, featuring Christina Hart and a young Ed Begley Jr., the second story, No Such Thing as a Vampire, is a step up in quality from the first episode, starring ubiquitous television character actor Elisha Cook Jr. as Carell and the urbane, frequently sinister Patrick McNee as Dr. Guerrilla. Despite every precaution, Guerrilla's wife Alexis, played by Anjanette Comer, is gradually weakening, succumbing to the nightly attacks of a creature that can only be a vampire. Family friend Michael, played by Horst Bullschultz, arrives at the scene and, despite his misgiving on the subjects of vampires, offers to help stand guard over the ailing Alexis. No such thing as a vampire is a stylish entry in this anthology and ultimately derives its greatest impact by turning the tables on the viewer while, at the same time, drawing out the end the viewer knows is coming. The final episode in Dead of Night is simply called Bobby, and by itself is the reason that Dead of Night finds itself on this list. Starring Joan Hackett and Lee Montgomery, Bobby is the claustrophobic and genuinely frightening tale of a mother who resorts to black magic in a desperate effort to restore her drowned son to life. It's probably best that I don't reveal much in the way of details about this episode so as not to spoil it for you, but I will say this. Of all the horror films I grew up watching, this episode of Dead of Night is notable as one of the few that genuinely scared me. This is Dan Curtis and Richard Matheson at the top of their collaborative horror game and should not be overlooked by any fan of classic horror. Mommy, it's you. It's really you. Number 6, Trilogy of Terror, 1975. Directed by Dan Curtis, Trilogy of Terror is almost certainly the most famous made-for-television horror anthology. Once again, we have three short stories by Richard Matheson, with the first two episodes being adapted for the small screen by William F. Nolan, who was the co-author of Logan's Run, and the final episode adapted by Matheson himself. All three episodes feature Karen Black in the starring role. In the first episode, Julie, Black portrays straight-laced college English professor Julie Elridge. One of Julie's students, Chad Rogers, played by Robert Burton, finds himself drawn to the reclusive Julie, suddenly being taken by the urge to find out what she looks like under all those clothes. Despite her initial reservations, Julie eventually agrees to go out with Chad, whom, we quickly discover, has ulterior motives. Unbeknownst to Chad, however, Julie isn't quite as harmless as she seems. While it's seldom mentioned, Julie is a classic Matheson tale in the tradition of be careful what you wish for, and is definitely worth a watch. The second episode, Millicent and Therese, concerns two sisters, one puritanical and the other amorous, potentially even murderous. Other than providing Karen Black with an opportunity to demonstrate her dramatic range, this episode is all too predictable and otherwise unremarkable. The third episode in Trilogy of Terror, simply entitled Amelia, was adapted by Richard Matheson from his short story Prey, and has become the stuff of horror legend. In the story, Karen Black portrays the eponymous Amelia, a single woman living alone in a downtown apartment building. Amelia has just purchased a gift for her boyfriend, a Zuni warrior doll, with the ominous name He Who Kills. Now, the warrior spirit of the doll is actually imprisoned within it by a gold chain fastened around the doll's neck, and, as you can probably already imagine, the chain doesn't stay on very long. Amelia leaves the doll for a time, and when she returns a while later, she's unable to find it. The doll, however, quickly finds her. Scenes from Amelia's battle with her tiny but vicious antagonist are forever burned into the memories of every Gen X kid out there. If you're a horror fan and you haven't seen this claustrophobic little nightmare, you need to remedy that situation immediately. For one last little tidbit here, in 2019, the original Zuni Warrior doll prop used in Trilogy of Terror sold for a whopping $204,000 and may rank as the most expensive movie prop ever auctioned.
Number five, Count Dracula, 1977. According to the most recent information I've seen, as of 2024, Bram Stoker's Dracula has been adapted for film, television, and the theater over 200 times. Most adaptations, including some of the best, drift rather wide to the source novel, but a few stand out as particularly faithful. And perhaps the most faithful of all is the BBC's 1977 production Count Dracula, starring Louis Jordan in the title role. The film has been criticized for the use of television cameras in various indoor sequences, and some horror fans think that Louis Jordan lacks the menace of others who have portrayed Dracula. But in my opinion, this is an all-around solid, atmospheric adaptation with memorable moments and great performances. While he may not evince the power and presence of actors like Jack Palance, Frank Langella, and Christopher Lee, the menace of Louis Jordan's Dracula lies in his cold, calculating demeanor. As he remarks to Dr. Van Helsing and Jonathan Harker in one of the film's best scenes, where he has asked why he left his home for England in the first place. We must recruit disciples, just as your leader has done. You shall not capture any more souls. This is a creature that clearly sees himself as superior to mortal men. You will die in a miserable allotted span. I have centuries before me. I am bound to this earth. I make it my domain. Language reminiscent of Satan's speech to God in the Old Testament book of Job. Opposing Dracula is Stoker's group of vampire hunters led by Dr. Abraham Van Helsing, portrayed here by Frank Finley, whose performance rivals that of the great Peter Cushing. Other standout performances include Bosco Hogan as Jonathan Harker and Judy Bowker, who captures the strength and intelligence of Stoker's Mina Harker as no other actress I've seen in the role. Sadly, this BBC adaptation of Dracula has largely lapsed into obscurity over the years, but many of those who've seen it will readily agree that it's the best adaptation of Dracula ever made. Number 4, Duel, 1971. Dennis Weaver stars as David Mann, a salesman who sets out on a business trip through rural California and finds himself in the ultimate game of cat and mouse when he's targeted by the homicidal driver of a tanker truck. Adapted for television by Richard Matheson from one of his own short stories and directed by Steven Spielberg in his second feature-length film, Duel has rightly become a TV movie classic and was a cable TV staple during the 1990s. Stephen King is referring to Duel as a, quote, gripping, almost painfully suspenseful rocket ride of a movie, surely one of the half-dozen best movies ever made for TV, unquote. I agree with this assessment. The talents that would later mark Spielberg as a genius filmmaker are fully on display in this early effort. The tight shots of Weaver, his car, and the pursuing truck lend the viewer the feel of being trapped in the cockpit of a vintage fighter plane in what amounts to a highway dogfight. The effect is still further heightened by the fact that we never actually get a good look at the driver of the truck. Indeed, you could almost believe that the truck itself is the antagonist. If you pay close attention while watching Duel, you'll probably notice a number of similarities with Jaws, which Spielberg went on to direct four years later. In fact, Spielberg himself has referred to Duel as, quote, Jaws on land, unquote, and has said that he feels that making this film actually qualified him to direct Jaws. Number 3, Dark Knight of the Scarecrow, 1981. Directed by Frank De La Fita, Dark Knight of the Scarecrow tells the story of three men who pursue and gun down a mentally handicapped man, Bubba Ritter, portrayed by Larry Drake, after he is thought to have attacked and killed a young girl. The men have no sooner committed their crime than they're contacted over CB radio and informed that the girl was actually attacked by a dog and that Bubba had in fact saved her life. <laughs> Rather than face a premeditated murder charge, the men staged the scene to make it appear that Bubba had threatened them and they were forced to kill him in self-defense. When attempts to prosecute the men fail, Bubba's mother is taken from the courtroom crying, You may think that you're getting all free, but there's other justice in this world besides the law! <laughs> and judging by the events that take place thereafter, Mama Ritter may just be right. Dark Knight of the Scarecrow is one of the creepiest, most atmospheric horror films I've ever seen. Everything about this movie works. The cast, the story, the pacing, the atmosphere, and the cinematography are all top-notch. And as with Don't Go to Sleep, this is another movie that keeps you guessing all the way up until the end as to whether the characters are dealing with human or supernatural vengeance. The three murderers are mechanic Skeeter Norris, played by Robert F. Lyons, Farmer Harless Hawker, played by Lane Smith, and small-town postmaster Otis Hazelrig, played by Charles Durning in a truly chilling performance. Durning's Hazelrig is one of the most ruthless and unsympathetic villains I've ever seen in a horror film. 
whatever else may be lurking in the background, supernatural or not, Hazel Rigg is the grinning face of an all-too-human kind of malevolence, and Durning's performance gives the film a greater depth than most others of its type. This is the kind of movie that you may only see once, but you'll never forget. Number 2, The Night Stalker, 1972. Adapted by Richard Matheson from a then-unpublished novel by Grant Jeffrey Rice, produced by Dan Curtis and directed by John Llewellyn Moxie, The Night Stalker is one of the finest horror films ever made for either the large or small screen. Darren McGavin stars as Carl Kolchak, a has-been big city reporter assigned to cover a string of murders involving young female Las Vegas night workers. Kolchak chafes at the assignment at first, but quickly warms to it when he discovers that all of these women had puncture marks on their throats and have been drained of their blood. At first, Kolchak believes that these murders are the doings of a super-powerful madman who merely thinks he's a vampire. But as the story progresses, a police cover-up ensues, and Kolchak finally witnesses the killer in action, he comes to believe that the Las Vegas Night Stalker is in fact a real live vampire. Made over a period of 12 days on a budget of approximately $600,000, The Night Stalker was an enormous hit for ABC, becoming the highest rated movie ever made for television until Nicholas Meyer's 1983 nuclear apocalypse film, The Day After. Indeed, producer Dan Curtis later on went to wish that they had released the film in theaters rather than on television. Darren McGavin is superb as Carl Kolchak. In fact, I would argue that this is the role he was born to play. McGavin's Kolchak is a flawed crusader, determined to get at the truth by any means possible, but not for reasons that are entirely altruistic. While he wants to see the killer stopped, he's also very well aware that he's sitting on the story of the century, and he's determined to use it to obtain the success and advancement that he believes he's been unfairly denied. The Night Stalker also features a solid supporting cast in Simon Oakland as Kolchak's editor Antonio Vincenzo, Claude Atkins in the role of police chief Warren Butcher, Kent Smith as the corrupt district attorney Thomas Paine, Ralph Meeker as Kolchak's FBI friend Bernie Jenks, and Barry Atwater as Janos Skorzeny, surely one of the creepiest vampires ever. Richard Matheson's adaptation of Rice's source novel is arguably a masterpiece. He not only effectively brings vampires into the modern age, but he also gives us two of the most memorable characters of 1970s television in the persons of Kolchak and Vincenzo, whose antagonism would carry over into a sequel film, The Night Strangler, in 1973, and a weekly television series, Kolchak the Night Stalker, in 1974. John Llewellyn Moxie's expert direction keeps the story moving deftly along, and frequent Dan Curtis collaborator Robert Colbert provides one of the most memorable film scores ever. Other excellent touches here include the decision to use Barry Atwater's vampire sparingly. We don't even get a good look at him until halfway through the film, and to give him no on-screen dialogue, which has the effect of making him seem less human and more truly monstrous, a creature driven solely by the need to kill. 52 years after its release, the Night Stalker's low budget and rushed production are sometimes apparent here, but it still stands as one of the best horror films ever made. Coming in at number one, and surely no surprise to any regular viewer of this channel, is Toby Hooper's 1979 miniseries adaptation of Stephen King's vampire novel Salem's Lot, starring David Soule, James Mason, Bonnie Bedelia, Lou Ayers, Lance Kerwin, and Reggie Nodler. David Soule portrays Ben Mears, a writer who, two years after the death of his wife, returns to his boyhood home of Jerusalem's Lot, Maine, intent on working on a new novel and exercising the demons of his past. Soon after his arrival, however, a local boy goes missing and others in the town fall mysteriously ill. Ben quickly realizes that there's a kind of plague in Salem's Lot, and it has something to do with the mysterious antique dealer Richard Straker, who recently purchased the Marston House, an infamous local landmark, and with his even more mysterious partner, Mr. Kurt Barlow, whom no one has yet seen. And now we have a Mr. Straker. And a Mr. Barlow. Whom no one has ever seen. And you think? I think that an evil house attracts evil men. And as the story unfolds, Ben and a handful of others must attempt to confront and destroy that evil before it can consume the town. Ask any group of Gen Xers what film scared them the most when they were growing up, and Salem's Lot will either be at the top or near the top of that list. I myself couldn't go near an open window at night for a couple of years after seeing it. Certain segments of the film have become iconic horror movie moments, and there is also an element of subtle horror woven throughout the film that evidences an unusual attention to detail on the part of director Toby Hooper and elevates the film above many modern horror movies made with much larger budgets. In short, Salem's Lot is a masterclass in atmosphere 
atmospheric horror. Among the standout performances here are David's soul and James Mason. As Ben Mears' soul conveys intelligence, determination, and a believable sense of dread, confronting both the undead menace and his long-standing fear of the Marston House, where he underwent a terrifying experience as a child. James Mason is wonderfully devious as Richard Straker. He exudes an old-world charm, but it's quite obviously a thin veneer. Beneath it lies both calculation and cold condescension. After seeing the film, Stephen King commented that Mason should have been cast as the master vampire Kurt Barlow, rather than as his familiar. Oh, yes. And speaking of Barlow, Reggie Nodler cuts a terrifying image beneath his heavy, grave, pale, Nosferatu-style makeup. Unlike the urbane, Dracula-esque Barlow of the novel, Barlow here is all animal menace, hissing and growling and never uttering a word. He has very little screen time, some of his screens having been cut, according to Nodler, but where he does appear, the film makes the most of him. We also have a strong supporting cast here with Bonnie Bedelia, whose performance as Ben's love interest, Susan Norton, conveys small-town charm and even a degree of innocence, but without making her seem mousy. Not an easy balancing act to pull off. Lou Ayers is excellent as Ben's mentor, Jason Burke, Matt Burke in the novel, as is Lance Kerwin as Mark Petrie, the boy who's into monsters and magic, and may be as foolhardy as he is brave. Ronnie Scribner and Brad Savage as Ralphie and Danny Glick are genuinely unsettling in their vampire form, as are Jeffrey Lewis as Mike Ryerson and Clarissa K. Mason as Marjorie Glick. Salem's Lot has aged in some inevitable ways, and it's not without its faults. Some would argue that it's too slow, especially in the first half, but this is basically a novel for television. And I would argue in reply that, while a few things could have been done differently, director Toby Hooper and screenwriter Paul Monash were right to take their time in establishing the location and characters. Salem's Lot is my favorite horror movie of all time, and in my opinion is the best, most atmospheric and unsettling vampire film ever made. So there you have it, my top 10 made-for-television horror movies. Let me know in the comments whether you agree or disagree, whether you have any further observations to offer, and if you think that I have unfairly left out other movies that ought to have been mentioned. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a like, please consider subscribing to the channel, and please share the content with anyone you think may be interested. Thank you very much, and until next time, Happy Halloween!